Thanks so much, Salam. Appreciate it. All right. Chris, CIO report. I'm not turning on my microphone, my CI report. What Susan is passing out for you is uh, uh, a one-page uh, performance chart of 2014. Um, just keep that with you in case you get questions from uh, the uh, public or anybody. Uh, we don't do a press release on the calendar year re uh, returns, um, and, uh, but you're going to get a much more thorough report from both of your consult all of your consultants at the next meeting. So this is just kind of a quick handout snapshot of where we are. I think I told you in the different conversation we had about CalPERS putting out their December numbers. And is there, because I, I got so many questions from teachers oh. last, what, two months ago in December, because they all read the LA Times and it said, you know, <laughs> CalPERS, you know, did however they did. Per, as of December 31st, and people were saying, well, how does that compare to Calster? <laughs> how so, did they get 18%? <laughs> Terry, so Frank, wondered. how did they get 18%? Don't know. <laughs> so uh, the LA Times <laughs> I know we're and its vast reporting staff, I'm sure it's great. It is a Southern California publication, just to point that out. <laughs> oh, don't go there. I know. Oh, my I'm gosh. Personal, personal What's up? pride in What's that great. Up? Hey, I grew up in SoCal, so I love, uh, I love the Times. Lived and breathed it. Um, what PERS did is they did a press release when they uh, issued their annual report, their CAFR. And what it picked up was their June 30 performance. And, and so now they have two June 30 numbers out there, the one they announced in July, and then a new one, which they announced in December, where they true up private equity and real estate. Um, so they did not earn 18% in calendar 2014. We could ask our consultant, did they? Which consultant? <laughs> yeah, they, their other consultant. Um, the best, uh, the best looking uh, I don't know, the so I don't know, uh, to be serious, I do not know what they earned in calendar 2014. Uh, they, boy, a big effort to coordinate with our staff, and they were going to announce it at their offsite. Yeah. Um, we sent it over to them the day before their offsite, and I'm just saying, somehow looking at our number, they decided not to announce theirs. I'm just saying. I'm just, let the, let the I'm just saying. Don't know what that means, but suddenly, no. You know, they, they would have had a rough year because the emerging, uh, the non-U.S. markets were negative in 2014, where the U.S. market was a positive 10. So you'll find that a lot of the, uh, we recorded a video to go on the dot-com website where I, I talk about the performance, and I said as a challenge to the people that watched it, you know, you can compare our 8.1 return to your portfolio. Uh, and actually, I'll pick on Phyllis Hall, who doc Phyllis, is she back there? She's not here. She was here yesterday and the day before. Um, uh, I, I would bet she beat us in her retirement fund, because if you had a U.S. dominance, or in a lot of 401ks and 403bs almost only have U.S. funds, those people would have done a 10% return from their U.S. investments. So um, just a snapshot. You know, as I tried to point out, for us, it's it's the halfway mark in the race. It, it doesn't really tell you a lot. Um, so, but you have that if you need it. Um, okay, so uh, the report. Normally, I show you growth in the portfolio, uh, but this June 30 or June 30 of December, what you're seeing is a very flat portfolio, uh, very little growth at all. Uh, in fact, because I know we get the request um, uh, for the number. The portfolio as of even yesterday still stood at 188, I think, 0.7 billion. Um, so a very flat year. It is tough to make money. Uh, it's going to be a real challenge as you see the chaos going on around us all the time around the world. Um, so we'll have to see how we do. Here's the asset allocation uh, that we've talked about earlier. I want to say, you know, we're very close to our targets in every case. 
Um, and we've been that way. And again, it has to do, I think, with the chaos of the world around us. It's tough to take a hard position about where, the, where we should be. Uh, we've been putting some of the cash to work, but very slowly and very cautiously um, because of this volatility that we're seeing in the market. Here's the market since June 30. You can see really wavy, um, back and forth, back and forth. And, and the bands of this you know, look pretty broad. They're really plus or minus 5% ranges. Um, so, but it has been a wishy-washy year. The yellow line shows you where we were at June 30. Um, and you can tell every time we have a negative day, we're back below to that line or below it. Positive days like yesterday, we're above it. But let's step back for a second. There we go. Wrong button. Let's step back for a second and, and look at the longer term. This is a three-year period all the way back to 2012. There's just that part I showed you in the prior slide. So it just kind of gives you some perspective. You can see the longer term trend is up to a higher market. But I think as I pointed out a couple of times, you, you can notice in that last little segment, kind potential, not necessarily a rolling over, but a flattening market. It, it has lost its momentum. GDP on companies is much smaller than it was. So we think it's going to be a tougher market. I keep pressing. I got too many buttons. Jeepers. There we go. So when you look out on the horizon, um, we're seeing a lot of risks right now. Central bank moves. I think it's important to point out to you, you know, the U.S. Fed obviously is flat. Uh, the Bank of England is pretty much flat, uh, but we're seeing, uh, obviously, the ECB and the Bank of Japan uh, easing, letting money go, and trying to uh, keep their interest rates low and keep their economy loose. So we're seeing a, a dispersion for the first time in those. I don't have to talk to you about the risk of internet hacking. Apparently, there was a headline today, so we all live that. Um, uh, we talked about, I need not say any more about climate change. We got that, a great presentation. You know, geopolitical, I would really, you know, we're still very worried about Russia. Uh, the oil price decline has had a really profound impact. Um, we were talking at lunch, the audience doesn't know. Uh, we talked about the fact that I, I met recently with, uh, in, in London with a private equity firm that invests a lot into Russia. Don't worry, we're not going to invest with them. But, but they were really pro-Russia six months ago. All of a sudden, a 180, complete turnaround, where now they admit, you know, Putin is really in charge. And what he told me is that the average person on the street in Russia, even the expats, firmly believe that this, you know, 50% decline in oil, the huge drop from 110 all the way down to 50 and below, was U.S.-led. Um, I've told you, you know, conspiracy theories, that's all, you, whatever you want. I'm sure somebody will make a movie about it. But uh, that's what Russia is hearing. And it's because it's a media-controlled market. But it does have a devastating effect, and it disrupts geopolitics. And I thought today, I've heard it before, but I had forgotten how much climate change has had a profound impact on, uh, on geopolitics. I thought his, uh, Al Gore's comment on Syria was just spot on with the change in arable land and how that leads to conflict and problems. So, and then obviously his discussion about natural disasters. Europe, um, you're going to hear more from us all the time about Greece. It was two years ago, the big debate I chaired it at Milken. Greece is in or out of the euro. Everybody's 100% Greece is out. Um, to bring it forward one year, Greece is definitely in. Now the question is, you know, does Greece has to go out of the euro? So it is not uh, in the developed markets index. It's in the emerging markets. Our managers use it opportunistically. Uh, we've been low weight, almost no weight in it. It's very cautious. So on the positives, same one. Don't fight the Fed. But obviously the Fed's very flat in here. Um, we've got, you know, slow GDP growth, low interest rates, and then PE ratios. So the chart that Alan Emkin asked for, uh, which is to look at the world, and the point is how low the interest rates are in the world. 
Uh, on the left side, uh, you've got uh, the U.S., U.K., and um, us, uh, probably Canada, um, ranging, as we've seen, at, at really 200-year lows. Australia, all the way up to 2.4%. So if you want to go to Aussie land, you can earn some interest. But look at Europe. Just remarkable. Italy, Spain, France, uh, Germany. Uh, just amazing that even the Spanish 10-year note, has a, an Italian 10-year note, has a lower yield than the U.S. 10-year note. Rather remarkable. And here's the one that caught everybody's attention. Uh, Switzerland, you can loan their government your money for 10 years, and you almost get all of it back, less a little surcharge for being in Switzerland, apparently. You don't get to go, but your money does. <laughs> but yeah, no negative, I mean, not just, we, we saw negative rates briefly in like one-year notes in Denmark and things like that. This is the 10-year bond, negative, negative rate. So where do you put your money to earn that big rate? Harry, with all his risk and rooting for the Mets, if you really want to, you can go to uh, Russia and earn 12.6%. Although I would point out Russia was, uh, I heard yesterday, one notch above uh, junk bond status by most of the rating agencies. Uh, so, and I think it is junk bond status by S&P. So, Alan, you wanted to comment on this as well. Really, very briefly, I wanted this to be before you as policymakers as you begin your asset liability work because one of the key issues that you're going to have to address is what does the future look like in terms of what you're going to get out of bonds. And anyone who's optimistic uh, about where you're going to get out of bonds just have to look at that slide. And, and just keep in mind, those yields are so low, that doesn't reflect strength. That reflects the fact that inter intervention by central banks is keeping interest rates low because if they don't do that, they fear their markets will go into recession or depression. So this is really being driven not by in the makers, the markets, it's driven by central bankers, and it's very important to recognize that. That, uh, there we go, that is the end of my report. I just always want to remind the public that watches and certainly our teachers in the audience, all of our quarterly reports, all of our annual reports, like the DMI report, are always available on the calsters.com website. We are also now going to be shooting and posting uh, quarterly videos where I'll just do like, a, this one's on, last, last quarter was on fees, that one's out there right now. But shortly, we'll post the one for this quarter, which will be on the 2014 performance. So every quarter, there'll be a new video from us on the dot-com website that people can see. I also want to highlight, um, hopefully, our members will look at it, and even teachers and students. We're asking each of the asset classes to shoot a, quarter, a, a video that's for a whole year about their asset class. So what in the world is private equity? When Sturz says real estate, what does real estate mean? We all might have bought a home, but what does it mean when Cal Stern's own real estate? So it's useful not just for our members, but even for the public, for educators, and, and we're hoping they actually get some play. And I think that way we're communicating to people on a bunch, bunch of medians. We're not mediums. We're not podcasting yet, but obviously when I teach Mike Dre and, Glenn, and Greg how to use the internet, then maybe we can get them out there. <laughs> You know we do tweet. That's already we're out there on Twitter Space and Facebook and. Did you see the Super Bowl commercial with Katie Couric and Brian Gumble? Yeah. What's yeah. The internet? I mean, that was one of the best. That was my favorite commercial. The Super Bowl. Don't even get. See, I should. I shouldn't have mentioned it. I have it recorded. So I have to it. Anyway, thank you, Chris. And I, I do applaud you for um, the videos. I do think. Um, we see an increased um, interest from our members, from teachers, about our portfolio, where we're invested, and, and the different asset classes. So I think that's great. And then one other thing I was going to ask is, are, are things like this, the handout that Susan gave us, are, I assume these are for public Yes, use? I just generated that last, <laughs> finished it this morning. Um, so we'll try and make it available for the public um, have, so you have, have our to, performance. 
I talked to Jack about it, like when we're going through the funding issue, sometimes it's just nice to have PDF, kind of downloadable PDF versions of things, one pagers for, for teachers out there that are speaking in groups or just to kind of have a one pager, real simple and easy, but it just, I think it helps us communicate clearly, whether it's about the funding issue or portfolio, I think it's a helpful tool for our members if, if they want it, if they want to use it. I will give you credit, you are channeling your former mentor, Carolyn Widener who asked exactly that's where this document came from. It technically had a backside, which I couldn't fill out and get to in the last two days in time, but it was designed to be an, a one-page, double-sided performance sheet you could take with you everywhere. This, I think, captures most of what you need to know, at least at calendar, but we'll make sure we do it, the full sheet for uh, the fiscal years every time. Thank you. Excellent. Any questions of Chris? Say our report. Oh, wait, one oh, more thing. Go ahead. Thank you. Oh my gosh, I almost forgot. Um, somebody behind the scenes that you guys hardly ever see, um, but I want to recognize her uh, because this is her last meeting. Uh, and if I would ask Sue Butler, where is Sue? Did she slip out? Sue, are you in the back? All right, so if we see if she comes back, Sue announced her retirement. She's retiring at the end of March, so she won't be here for your April meeting. She's, in essence, been our secretary for the investment committee and controls all the communications, so she'll be very difficult to replace. But when she comes back, she usually sits over there on the edge. If you could just uh, wave to her and say goodbye to her, she would appreciate it. She's been fantastic. Chris, I do have a question from Tom. Um, yeah, I, just a quick thing. You almost always comment on the employment reports. Yes, sir. The numbers yeah. just came out today. And the numbers came out today, so I was going to send you an email on Monday. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think it's interesting. If you remember, December was good headline numbers, but bad in the inside. Uh, this was viewed as bad headline numbers, but actually good information on the inside. What you saw was a little more... Um, bump in the hourly earning, hourly wage earnings, mostly due to the minimum wage rising. Uh, in a couple of states, I think the number I'm going to say off the top of my head is, is 20, uh, 30, 39 states or 29 states have, have above the federal minimum wage standard. And um, uh, discouraged workers, as we said, they suddenly disappeared. They stopped looking for work in December, but as we predicted, they're going to start looking for work in the better time period, that number, they think they got more jobs. So, um, uh, and the people dissatisfied, the, the, they're trying to measure the people that get part-time jobs, that want full-time jobs, those numbers are actually improving too. So overall, the employment report was right in with line with what the Fed's looking for. Again, stable, solid, but then you got all the chaos of the markets around us. So it's really hard to figure out how to make money in this market uh, it's, it's, we think you're going to continue to have that wave and that roller coaster for the rest of the year. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. All right, seeing no other questions, uh, we will move on to item 14, the DBSCB minimum rate risk mitigation, Alan, PCA. Uh, we were just following up a staff request to report on a question that uh, Mr. Unterman asked at a prior meeting. Um, it's a specific question, it has a specific answer, is should we, in the DBS program, should we hedge against the minimum interest rate? Yeah. Um, that's what that's the question. Maybe. Want me to stop? I'm just okay. saying, I'm just thinking maybe we should, sorry, I'll just, sorry. I think this is a question that I think, Tom, that you had asked, so I just wanted to make sure that, Yeah. Okay. no worries, it's all good. So, Neil, go ahead and so rewind. Prior, me prior meeting, Mr. Unterman asked a question about should we hedge the minimum interest rate? That was forwarded to PCA from staff. Specific question, has it been, and we gave a specific answer, and the answer is no. And um, I can go into elaborate on that in any detail, but that was the quick answer. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> that might have been the fastest item we've ever had <laughs> at Calsters. That was a record. Speed oh, my post. gosh. We can provide more color, but my question related to a program that I think yeah. really needs some other kind of attention. Uh, and you guys spent a lot of time on that yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Challenging program. Any other comments? No. 
Okay. Thank you so much. You do get the record, I think. That was probably nicely done, Neil. Appreciate it. Save you time. What's that? <laughs> He's gonna. We'll see how he makes it with Life this out here. Bye now. Uh, and so, item 15. Paul, Chris, infrastructure policy revision, revise. Paul and Dilo. Paul and Dilo. Mm -hmm. All right, Dilo. I did talk with Paul a little bit um, in Harry and I's preparatory meetings on Wednesday that um, we're going to do the deeper dive in April on infrastructure and um, and we'll get to meet the whole. So can you make sure that infra, all the infrastructure staff or the the whole team comes for that presentation so we get to meet them yep. the new hires? Oh yeah, no, we'll bring them forward and and just to embarrass her, just because she walked in back to take a moment of privilege. Um, there she is. Sue Butler there in she the back. Is. Recognizing you for all of your years of work, and and that this is your last investment committee meeting. Enjoy, so enjoy, you. enjoy your retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> is that what your staff calls you, Ailman? Ailman? Usually, it's uh, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you have the meat of asset allocation. I like to think now you're going to be dealing with the dessert uh, with infrastructure uh, policy update. Um, Paul, let me just, actually, I was realizing there's some new board members. Judy, oh, can we just introduce Judy Chambers from PCA? Since, or Judy, can you introduce yourself to some of the new board members that might? Sure. I'm Judy Chambers from PCA, New York office. And so Judy works with infrastructure and so it's sort of a consultant on PCA's behalf to our infrastructure team. Introduce. Okay. Okay. Um, before you is the 2015 infrastructure policy update. Um, if I had to take away, I tried to put onto the one slide. The there's about eight items, but this is sort of the big things that we have going on. Wanted to adjust the performance benchmarks, changing them from CPI plus five to plus four. Wanted to clarify leverage uh, levels. We had uh, we don't want to talk about goals or maximum. We we assigned the word leverage to them or levels to that. We also added a definition of consortium, uh, since that is something that we've been working on for a while. And we also wanted to update the discretionary authority in terms of uh, staff's ability to uh, uh, engage in transactions. Uh, this is an information item, a first reading. If it looks okay, the board has the option to go ahead and approve it at this uh, first reading. Um, with that, if there's any questions, um, consultants are here and we're all here as well. Judy, did you want to make any comments or? No, we are, I mean, we're fine with the report, um, and, uh, the policy as it is. Great. Any questions from? Okay. We've got a motion on the floor. Paul, go ahead. So on INV 159, this, this isn't anything that is a change, I don't think, but but it's it's under benchmark change. So it says, while most asset classes have market index benchmarks that are instantaneously, that instantaneously reflect the pricing and return environment for that asset class, infrastructure has an absolute return benchmark that may need to be adjusted from time to time to reflect current market pricing and expectations. What, what I'm confused by what we mean by an, an absolute return as opposed to uh, a market index. That, that's, uh, that's from Makita's memo, so I'll, I'll address okay. that, Paul. Uh, with most of your other asset classes, for example, uh, U.S. equities, uh, when you do your asset, um, allocation process or you assign a benchmark to the global equity team, um, the forward-looking uh, return expectations for that uh, reflect current valuations in the marketplace. So, for example, uh, relative to five years ago um, when valuations in stock markets um, were lower than they are today, your expected return for stocks is, um, 
is likely lower today than it was five years ago. The infrastructure asset class has a benchmark that's tied to um, uh, CPI plus a premium over that over CPI. So uh, that premium um, reflects the return for a variety of risks that you accept when investing in infrastructure assets. As risk premiums across the board have declined over the last five years, it's appropriate to uh, to think about reducing the premium that you're assigning over over CPI for the infrastructure asset class. So going from 5% to 4% is because we perceive, or the investment community perceives the risks to infrastructure as having been reduced. And so the premium should be reduced. Um, there's, there's a variety of reasons to reduce the, the, um, the premium over CPI. Um, but one of those reasons uh, is that in today's pricing environment, to maintain a consistent risk level in the infrastructure portfolio, a CPI plus 4% benchmark is more standard in the marketplace and more reasonable than maintaining a CPI plus 5. In today's pricing environment, to get a return of CPI plus 5, you'd, you'd have to take incremental risk to achieve that. Okay, so it's much, not much, much like in the, in the stocks. Let's say, for example, five, five years ago, you might have expected uh, uh, equities to return 10% per year over the next 10 years. Today, you're only expecting equities to return maybe 8% per year over the next uh, 10 years. So in order to, if you wanted the equities to continue to produce 10% a year, you'd have to increase the risk quite a bit of that equity portfolio. So this, this just recognizes that pricing environments change and unless you want to adjust the risk of your portfolio through policy, you should reflect the, 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 the benchmark or the hurdle that they should achieve. Continue to take on the same risk that we That's have right. expected in the past. We should only expect CPI plus 4 return, not CPI plus 5 return. That's correct. Got it. Thank you. Also, the other thing that's occurring in the industry, too, is there's um, a number of uh, uh, entities working on creating benchmarks um, for infrastructure. It's all in the early stages at this point, but it is still it's being talked about, and they're trying to figure out how to do that in the asset class. Any other questions? Now yeah, we can go back so to there, Tom. So Tom had a, there was a motion. I move approval. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Excellent. Approved. Thank Thanks you. so much. <coughs> All right, Anne, come on up. Corporate governance proxy voting guidelines. This is another item, item 16, where we as a board, it's an information item, but we can make it an action item. And I know there is some interest, no pressure, but interest from Anne Sheehan and her team for us to move approval because proxy season is upon us. Exactly. But, you know at the discretion of the board. Good afternoon, everyone. As Sharon said, this is a, it's a first read, but it is up to the board, just like with the last item that you took, um, if you want to approve it. This is really a rewrite, a revision, kind of a reformatting of our proxy voting guidelines. Um, it's been since 2011 that we actually added anything, and I think some of you who were here then, the last thing that we added was the political contribution, the proposals that we've seen more of those. So we put some specifics into our proxy voting guideline as how we look at those proposals. But in short, the policy that we're voting is the same in our new guidelines. We just added a few more details on some issues that we see more that we are voting on, as well as we think it's important for STIRS in our desire to be transparent with our policies, our investment policies, as well as our proxy voting policies, to put a little more information. And specifically on this one, we spent more time on the board of directors, the role of the board of directors, how they look at succession planning, diversity on boards. 
We looked at the tenure of boards. So you will see in the guidelines a little bit more discussion about how we vote these issues, how we look at these issues when we do engagements with companies. The other thing that we put in, this year we're going to have a lot more voting, voting on proxy access proposals, the ability for large long-term shareholders to nominate directors to company boards. And so we wanted to put into our proxy voting guidelines what our policy is and how we'll be voting on those. And you will see in here that it's a 3% in three years for a group of shareholders up to 25% of the board. And that policy really is the same policy that the SEC adopted a number of years ago. Um, unfortunately, the rule was nullified due to not the specifics of the rule, but the cost-benefit analysis. The D.C. Circuit Court didn't feel they did a sufficient cost-benefit, so it's back at the SEC. But we really felt and had participated with the SEC in developing that and provided comments. We thought that was a very good guideline. So we wanted to make it clear to companies and to other shareholders how we'll be, we will be voting on that proposal this upcoming year. So um, I know there's a lot of writing in here, and it looks like we added a lot, but it really is a reformatting, a little more information so that people know what our policies are. We get asked frequently for our policies. We post them on the website. So it's helpful to us to have these revised policies with a little more detail on them and then to post them on our website. So I am happy to answer any questions if anyone has any specifics on the guidelines. Any questions for Ann? Seeing Dana? I'm sorry. It's okay. I had a hard time getting in there. Um, so, Anne, I have a series of questions, and I also have some grammatical stuff that we can meet offline on. Um, I love it. It was D and Paul. They just skated right through that. So, um, Going to board refreshment, I just have to say when I read the sentence, regular board refreshments should provide the board with opportunities, that just kind of struck me as the wrong kind of refreshment. So I was just, you know, I was thinking refreshments, yes. So is that, is that terminology common? Technology kind of in our world, and I suspect we just get used to using that. So we can, um, no, we can. Fine. If everybody's going to understand it, I am perfectly fine with it. But it, it just really struck me weird. Is, we want to make sure that boards are not comprised only of individuals who are, you know, 25 Absolutely. years on the board, and they're not getting new blood, new thinking inside the boardroom is really the concept behind that, Dana. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then the next one is on AMV uh, 200. And it's when we're talking about board independence. And the last sentence under B just reads strange to me, so I want to make sure that I understand what yes. we're actually talking about. That actually, the, the 120,000 and the... No, it's not the 120,000. It's They're not considered independent if they're employed by the company, correct? Right. Or if they own 20% interest in the company, correct? Yeah. If they're a large so, shareholder in the company. So then we need to tweak the sentence. Okay. Okay. And then the last one, we only talk about meeting adjournments for special meetings. Would there ever be a time that any of these companies would adjourn a regular meeting? in order to solicit more support for any of their voting items? Um, not items? unless they have a special item on that regular meeting agenda. Most of the time that they would try and either continue the meeting are in special situations, mergers and okay. acquisitions. Okay, so situations. it does only really pertain to special <laughs> yeah. situations then. All right, yeah. and then everything else I can, we can talk about. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Are you okay, Vanna? Yep, I'm done. Okay. Any other questions from board members? If not, I um, do we feel comfortable going ahead and I move approval. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Excellent. It is approved. Good luck in proxy season. <laughs> yeah, have fun. All right. We are on I the last of three uh, first readings. Uh, coming up is Sandy Blair and uh, Candace Ronan. Um, and there they are. Uh, this is because uh, you haven't seen the investment policy for Pension 2 very often. Uh, you adopted it for the first time. Um, 
gosh, less than a year ago. Um, but this is the program that's jointly, you know, obviously Pension 2 is under Ed Derman and managed uh, with Sandy as the new director. And then uh, the uh, investment options and the investment choices are under me and managed by our global equity team led by Candace. So I'll turn it over to you ladies. Okay, so as Chris mentioned that this is our first reading and we seek um, any feedback that the committee may have or you may choose to approve this today. So a brief history, um, the Pension 2 program began in 1994 known as a Voluntary Investment Program, which is offered to all school employees. Through the years, the program has seen substantial growth and we now have assets in excess of a half a billion dollars. In 2005, Meridian um, Fiduciary was hired as our program consultant, and his contract included the investment advisory services. <coughs> Wanting to be consistent with the delegation of the th authority of the Pension II investment to the CIO in June 2013, it is important for the CalSTRS investment staff and the board's consultant, PCA, to have greater oversight of this committee. This has facilitated the proposed changes in the investment policy statement. Candace? Thank you. There are really three um, revisions to the policy that we'd like to bring to your attention. The first is a correction to the asset class designations. So two of the items that are currently listed in the policy really refer to types of assets within the asset class alternative um, assets. And the other is really more a style of investing, a style of investing, uh, socially responsible investing. And so the recommended designations really more appropriately reflect the full investment opportunity set. The second is a change to the structure of the committee from five uh, CalSTR staff to eight, which includes four defined contribution solutions staff, as well as four investment staff. Um, and we feel that that it will create a balanced committee uh, between the DCS staff and the investment staff. Um, and it also allows um, Chris, our CIO, to have additional authority and oversight of the program and as Sandy said, given the delegation of authority to uh, Chris in September of 2013, um, staff believes that this is an appropriate structure. And then third, um, as Sandy mentioned, um, prior to the end of November, the sole consultant to the program was Meridian Consulting, um, who provided input related to investments as well as the, the program itself, plan administration. Um, and with the board's delegation of authority, um, we felt that it was important, actually Chris particularly felt that it was important to add um, the board's consultant, PCA, um, to advise relative to the investments of the uh, program. Um, and as Sandy stated, Meridian continues to provide services related to the plan administration. Um, those were the um, items that we thought were important to mention to you, but we'd be happy to take any questions that you have for us. I have a couple questions. I'm so sorry. PCA. Hi. Well, I'm Eric from PCA, and I work predominantly with our DC clients. Okay. Okay. I have a couple, but any other board members have questions? Um, I was just curious a little bit about the advisory committee. So you're you're suggesting moving it from five to eight. What does the committee do? What is what, what are they making decisions on? I believe it's eight, right? Mm -hmm. right. right? Um, all right? Okay. Um, so what are they making decisions about? Are they deciding what what um, you know, what actual uh, I'm trying to think of <laughs> plans are in there, investment plans so are in there. <laughs> one of our primary um, considerations are the uh, mutual funds that we will um, recommend to Chris. Um, uh, for the plan participants, and so that's one of our primary duties. And then Sandy can elaborate on, um, you know, some of the other things that we work on are the structure of the plan and what have you. In in alignment with feedback that we get from participants, it is primarily that choosing of the investment choices within the Pension Two program, um, as well as the allocations for the Easy Choice portfolios, the Glide Pass, as we change those as time goes on. <coughs> Catches me. Is there an issue with it being an even number, like it being eight instead of five, in terms of if there's? I don't. I can't imagine you having lots of controversy over which, which tools. But that just was the first thing that struck me. Is typically you like committees being odd number so that mm -hmm. there's a tiebreaker. And I don't know if the chief 
Chris Ailman as the tiebreaker, or yeah. how that works. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a topic of discussion, and, and we did um, decide that um, we felt that it would be appropriate to, if we did have what I would call a hung vote, that we would be able to take that to Chris and, and um, have his input and guidance. Okay. Great. Any other questions? Seeing none, I would entertain a, a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Sentence? Great. It is approved. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your work on that. Thank you. Uh, item 18 is a review for information requests. Lamont? I don't think we have any. We have plenty of work to do already. <laughs> All right. So um, let's move to item 19, which is a draft agenda for the April Investment Committee meetings. Any comments? Yes. Terry, let me get you. I have, I'm having a hard time with the vision over here. <laughs> Go okay. ahead, Terry. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was listening to uh, the, this committee's discussion of the whole issue related to sustainability, and uh, I was considering whether we should have something at the next meeting for, for the investment committee on sustainability. And then I realized that the investment committee, it is a committee of the board, but also the investment committee's agenda for April and probably for about the next six to nine months is jam-packed you know, with uh, a lot of other very important items. So since this, I think this is a major board concern, I was thinking that we could move to the regular meeting agenda, an agenda item, something like the path forward on sustainability uh, for the April meeting. Um, make some adjustment to the our regular board agenda. We seem to have a little bit more flexibility during regular board meetings to possibly devote some time to this this important issue. And maybe at this first meeting in April, we could have some report back from you know the the visit uh, uh, to see how much more progress uh, the European funds and and uh, managers are doing. We could have a report back from. Mercer, our consultant in this area, and then maybe we can have some further discussion on basically a path forward. Are we interested in ultimately having some form of committee, or should it stay entirely with investments? But maybe putting that topic as an agenda item on the regular board meeting would free up or, our, or create some opportunity for us to move forward in this area in a, uh, without feeling rushed and uh, be able to give it adequate attention. So I'd like to recommend that. I don't know if you could direct that by the is chair. Is that a direction or? to you, Mr. Chair? Or? So what I, what I suggest is that I work with our chief executive officer and the vice chair of the board, Ms. Hendricks, and we'll, we'll chat and talk about how we can structure that, taking into consideration Mr. McGuire's comments and suggestions. And unless there's strong opposition to that suggestion, we, we will, we will uh, coordinate with Jack and, and and put something together. We do have. I was just thinking though. Um, we do have uh, the April agenda is a little more intense than it traditionally will be because we're going to have interviews, uh, about three hours of interviews. So keep that in mind in terms right. of. And we have to be sensitive to, to that as well. So we've heard the comments. It looks like there's support up on the board to do something along those lines, and we'll we'll, we'll follow up. Thanks, Terry. Great. Thank you. Dana. Oops. So Jack. Hang on. If we're going to have, I mean, it sounds like both the investment committee and the board's agendas for April are going to be pretty impacted. Do we need to move any of the other committees to the first day? Right. Uh, probably, yeah. They probably just squeeze the first day up since we usually start the first day at noon. I'll, I'll look and see what's meeting to, to see if we need to start that day earlier. I'll, 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 we always do a time check on every agenda, but I'll, I'll bear that in mind then. Yeah. yeah. And share and, and let us know as soon as possible. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other input on the draft agenda for April? Seeing none, um, 
Our last item is opportunities from statement from the public, and I believe we have one person, Jessica Denning. Jessica, are you here? Miss Denning. Great. Welcome, Miss Denning. <coughs> Microphone. <laughs> my first time coming to the meeting and I am uh, so glad to be here and I'm thankful to you for the care and conscience that, with which you've managed my retirement and my fellow teachers retirement funds. I retired five years ago and uh, you know you don't get evenings. I heard her talk but you don't get evenings and weekends off when you retired and my passion has been uh, uh, now that my parents passed away and I have a time in my life when I have a moment to pause, because I know you're all so busy with your jobs, to notice what it is that I've been eating and to find out that I've been eating genetically engineered foods. And so I worked and got a million signatures on Prop 37, and we put it on the ballot. We were narrowly defeated, but it was a huge victory because now we have bills in Vermont and uh, Maine and Connecticut, and we've had dozens and dozens of bills across the United States for labeling genetically engineered foods. And um, we, are, I had SB we had a, a coalition that had SB 1381 in the legislators last year. But there's just so much we can do in legislation. There's so much we can do in voting with our dollar. And we're changing the marketplace. Actually, I'm a member of the Grange. And we had a, a, a resolution that went to the Farm Bill. And we got $291 million in the United States for organic farming. And we do what we can do with legislation, but it comes down to voting with your dollars. And we really realize that so much of that is the investment money. That's my, uh, you know, that I'm getting my money from. When I looked at the, and I love the conversations in this room, it's so powerful. Um, where, what are we doing for sustainability with our dollar? And so I'd like to say, I hear you talking about, want to hear about that. I have five minutes, and I'll tell you what I know. I'm legislative director in California for labeled GMOs. And what I've learned with talking with uh, all these last uh, full-time for years when I found out about this, and I'm a science teacher with 20 copyrights and rotation diets, and I just found out about it. And I've fig if I ever figured, if I did not know that I'm eating pesticide delivery factories that are engineered to be sprayed 99% of the time with uh, pest herbicides, which are basically pesticides, then maybe other people don't know, and I need to make this my life work. And so that's why I'm here. So... Um, most of us grew up on organic food, or what we call it as food. And uh, so, uh, I want you to know that 55% of greenhouse gases are due to confined animal feeding of GMOs and the accompanied deforestation. And if you watch the movie Co Cowspiracy, it's a really good breakdown on that in every single way, and why it kind of gets ignored in the conversations in government, but that's something that we can basically change. Uh, with every bite we eat, and where we're watching that our animals come from, that they are putting carbon back in the soil, that they're pastured animals. Um, okay, one out of two children in America today have a chronic illness, such as asthma, allergies, autism, autoimmune disease, cancer, obesity, and diabetes. Half the kids in Sacramento are obese. And you know, diabetes means blindness, it means amputated legs. I think if anyone has someone in the family with diabetes, we're looking in 13 years is the diabetic costs will be our entire health budget of the United States with no money left over for anything else. And m much of that can be traced to the food we're eating. And we know that, and I've seen the courageous legislators try and uh, change that this year in the legislature with a sugar warning label on drinks, and they, it was beaten down by somebody who was selling sodas. So how, how are we? investing our money here. And I noticed, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to name names, but we're investing in Monsanto, we're investing in Syngenta and Coca-Cola. And as teachers, we know those are not things, they are, they're foods grown heavily with pesticides, contributing to greenhouse gases and global warming, and not to the health of the future of our children and planet. Syngenta's been battling in Hawaii to not tell the poisons that they're spraying uh, right up to the school windows. And uh, right now, there's a bill in Hawaii uh, not allowed to allow any counties to make any rules about that. They just want to know what's poisoning their children. I guess I have to say the background, which is in 1992, uh, Michael Taylor was uh, head of public policy for the Food and Drug Administration. 
and he was in charge of getting these great GMOs to market. And it sounded like a really good idea. And in 1990, as a science teacher, we thought a GMO was like a Lego. You just put in a gene and you take, and it's a simple, orderly thing. But then when we found out in the year 2000 that there were only um, 30,000 genes uh, for making 100,000 proteins, we knew that one gene has to make more than one protein. It's much more complex than we thought. And the oncogenes can be triggered and so on. So it's not the simple science we thought when we started out. In 92, Michael Taylor said, they look and taste the same, therefore we're not gonna label and we're not gonna test. And the FDA never has. They depend on the companies themselves to submit testings. And the EPA has not a single test to show safety on Roundup, which is what these foods are genetically engineered to be sprayed with. They only have safety testings 40 years old on glyphosate. One of the tests, I'll read you a couple that are important to me as a mother, and to many of the other mothers I talk to around the United States. One says, after, oh yeah? Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Can you, we, it's a five minute? Okay, so we that, need you to wrap up. We've got to Okay, great, let me go. <laughs> so after four days, the majority of the oysters were um, closed and not feeding at point 0.99 to 3.8 parts per million, which we could, I measured carmichael water. We have 0.15 parts per million in carmichael, per billion in carmichael water. That's above the label drinking water. We're watering our plants with it. And then, we, another study this week showed that glyphosate does not biodegrade as it once claimed. In fact, it remains viable in dark salt water for 30, 351 days. What is in our womb? Dark salt water. How big is a six-week-old fetus? The size of a shrimp. And shrimp at five parts per million died after 96 hours. So there's, well, they're not testing, but you can, in your investments, help to support, and I, would, I don't know if I, I had time, so that's the end of it, but I wanted to ask you what I could do to support you, because I'm totally behind your, um, whatever you're doing, and we, Moms Across America, which I represent, Northern California directors, we would, be happy to provide you with any information that would be helpful to you in your investments. Thanks, Ms. Denning. Appreciate it. All right. That ends our open session. We have, I believe, one last item in closed session. So all the folks that are here from the public, thanks so much for spending the last two and a half days, day, half a day, however long you were. Um, enjoy the weekend. Drive safely out there. <laughs> <laughs>